Greetings, Marsh here, and welcome to episode zero of my Industrial Revolution 3 playthrough. This is episode zero because we are just going to talk about the mods and the mod settings and the map generation settings that'll go into our playthrough. If you'd rather just go straight to the gameplay, then you can skip forward to episode one. Of course, we have this nice main screen here with high-tech electric stuff on the left and low-tech steam stuff on the right with the uh, blimps flying by. <laughs> and of course there's always something hidden behind the main menu. Alright, let's talk about the mods here. And first of all, the mod list has a lot of extra mods that I'm not using for this playthrough. Ones that were a part of the Angel Bob's playthrough and ones that will be a part of the Pyanodon's playthrough. So don't pay too much mind to the things that are disabled here. Just the core of the Industrial Revolution 3 mods. There's the main one and the asset packs. The airships adds, well, flying airships. And I haven't actually used these yet, so that'll be interesting. But they're kind of like flying logistics. And deep space mining is like an add-on on the end. I expect this to be a one rocket factory, but if you launch more than one rocket, this is something to uh, take advantage of that. Forestry combinators is an add-on for a certain type of building in IR3 that grows trees. And the combinator just gives you a little extra control over that. I don't think I would use them, but I added it in there. Also, for IR3, you can get loaders and ingot stacking. The loaders are as they are in other mods, where they just uh, load items into or out of chests without using inserters. And a stacker, it stacks ingots, or as the game will say, ingot-shaped things, into groups of four. So it's a uh, four times multiplier for throughput. However, one thing to note is I haven't updated that mod past the 1.0.8 version, because for some reason the new version kind of... Um, broke the on-screen display a little bit, like when you look and it says how many raw resources you need for a certain item, it doesn't quite display right with the new version, so I'm gonna wait until that's fixed. So I'll use this older version so the display works. Basically, it would say you didn't have the resources for something, like if you wanted to craft something, it, it wouldn't even be displayed, like it would basically be zero, but if you clicked the button, it would start crafting the thing, so it's kind of a little, little weird like that, but I'm sure It'll get fixed quite quickly, but for now, I will disable it. And IR3 actually comes with a lot of other things added in that are normally part of other mods. So let's cover the other mods that I do have, and also mention the ones that aren't in there. As far as the mods that I'm using, I tried to keep it pretty simple because IR3 is such a complete mod pack as is. You don't really need to add that much. Plus, I also don't want to make this a giant playthrough. I mostly want to just show off IR3 and not a bunch of other mods that... I've basically already used. So additional paste settings just allows you to change how you copy and paste things like a logistics requests for assembling machines and stuff like that. Alien biomes, of course, gives you all the different types of biomes besides just the plain sand <laughs> that you normally get. So it's a little more interesting to look at and the high resolution pack for that. Automatic station painter and train painter just paint the trains based on the resources that they're currently carrying and it just makes it a little more visually interesting. Belt visualizer is kind of like pipe visualizer but it just shows you lines for where all the belts are going so if you have a lot of spaghetti it can help make sense of it and one thing about IR3 is it's vanilla like which means you're gonna see spaghetti. And better victory screen for showing more details when you win and IR3 is configured for it so we might as well use it. And one thing that's not really required and I guess you can go to IR3 here and it shows you some optional dependencies which you can decide to use like rubber belts, airships, loader stacking and also these larger lamps which I'm choosing not to use. Because I'm just using vanilla nights it's not going to be permanent darkness or 100% darkness or anything like that I'm just going to use the vanilla lights so these lights otherwise are pretty OP if you're just using normal nights. But one thing it recommends is the black rubber belts, and it is exactly what it sounds like. It just makes the belts black. It's just cosmetic, but it fits IR3 really well. It does have a disadvantage, and that is it doesn't show black objects very well. And really the only thing you're going to deal with that's an issue is coal, because it blends in so well with the belt. So. One disadvantage of using this is it can be hard to look at a belt and see how much is flowing if it's specifically certain types of coal. Because of course there's more than one type in this mod. But it's worth it because it just fits the aesthetic and in fact if you look behind, it is using them already. And you can tell that these look so much better compared to the vanilla belts. 
at least with the IR3 buildings. We are not using the bottleneck mod, which puts a little circle on top of buildings to show you how fast the building's going and if it has any issues. And the reason why we're not adding it is because IR3 has it as a part of the mod. So if you look at these buildings, at least the electric ones, of course, the steam ones do not do this, but the electric ones have little lights and these green lights aren't here for show. They're saying that the building is running at full speed and thus you get the green light. So if it's not, like that one turned yellow for a bit. And I think IR3 in the description said it was the first major mod pack that included this as a part of the mod pack instead of a separate mod. So that is just one thing of many that IR3 just gives you as a part of the mod pack that you don't need any special mods for. And the calculator is just an on-screen calculator we can use if we need it. We don't need Canal Builder or anything that makes water because, of course, AR3 has something like that in it. Circuit HUD allows you to take electrical signals from the network and allows you to put them on an on-screen display that you can always see. It's not that important with vanilla compared to the complex mod packs, but it's still useful. Even in vanilla, when you're doing oil processing and cracking the oils down, it's nice to just know what's happening there because it doesn't take much for those systems to get clogged up. So even in vanilla, I think Circuit Hut has a place. Of course, this isn't vanilla and it'll certainly help us a little bit. Clockwork is the mod I use to change the day-night cycle and I have changed it slightly for this. I'll get into what was changed, but uh, don't worry, it's no permanent night or 100% darkness or anything. It's mostly vanilla, but uh, I'll show what I changed there. Not including Crafting Combinator, it's a useful mod that allows you to change the recipes on machines, but it's actually not as required with IR3 compared to other mods because IR3, a lot of the recipes on machines will automatically be set based on the input resource. You don't actually have to set them. So there are certain situations where on other mod packs we would want to use a Crafting Combinator, but we just don't have to with IR3. Even distribution is super convenient for just uh, control clicking and dropping items in chests. However, <laughs> I'm going to say this a lot, IR3 has something similar to that already. It's not exactly the same, but it kind of mimics the same function, but they don't completely overlap. So there will be reasons to use both what comes with IR3 and that. Evo GUI, well, it doesn't show any uh, thumbnail there, but all it does is have an indicator at the top left for the time played and evolution factor and stuff like that. And I find out of all of the GUIs that is the smallest and most convenient for doing that. And factory search is pretty useful for any size of factory, but it just allows you to search for any items in the factory, be it entities or items in chess or items that are being produced. And it's just really nice. And fluid wagon color mask is similar to the station painting mods. That just also does the same thing for liquids. And of course, we're going to use Hellmod. One important thing to note is the most recent version of Hellmod, at least at the time of this recording, is a little broken, so it doesn't quite work, but it'll work well enough. And surprisingly, we're actually not going to use Hellmod that much for this playthrough. It's just not going to be complicated enough. But there are certain situations where we will want to use it, but compared to Angel Bob's, it's just not going to come into play as much. Of course, all of the IR3 stuff. Inserter throughput puts a little number next to the inserter when you hover over it to tell you how many items a second it does. And it's really convenient for figuring out how many inserters you need because it dynamically calculates it based on the exact situations to which it is operating. And looking at this thumbnail, that number is going to be a lot bigger than it will be on this video because I'm playing in 4K and that number, for whatever reason, does not scale with 4K. So if you don't have 4K, you're probably not going to be able to read it or even see it. It's going to be very small, but on a 4K screen, you can see it. But if you ever hear me saying, oh, this inserter does this many per second, well, it's because I looked at that number and that's how I knew. And then inventory sensor. This is probably one of the biggest content mods I'm adding to this, which is barely even counts as content because it's a single thing. But inventory sensor is so incredibly useful. It basically allows you to read the contents of anything you attach it to, such as assembling machines and nuclear reactors. And specifically, just for nuclear reactors alone, it's worth it because then you can easily set the reactor up to not waste any fuel and be perfectly efficient. And for that reason alone, I have to use it. Not including jetpack, it would be useful, but I don't think the factories are going to be big enough to where it really matters. And I really want to try to stick with IR3's various items rather than adding in a bunch of other ones. So adding in something like inventory sensor already kind of makes me a little uncomfortable. Of course, we don't need loaders because 
there's a separate one for IR3. Not adding LTN, because we're just not going to have enough trains for it to matter. And Milestones is compatible with IR3, so we might as well use it to get cool uh, indicators on when various things happen. And Module Inserter for easily using robots to change the modules out on various machines, and this is quite useful as you upgrade to better modules. We don't need nanobots or any early bots because IR3 gives them to you. Just using the vanilla enemies, not adding in any special biter stuff. And then a big change is adding picker dollies, which allows you to move entities that have already been placed on the ground. And I did change the hotkeys to operate this. Normally you have to use the arrow keys to move a machine. So basically you would take your cursor and like place it over a machine, highlight it, and then take your hand off the mouse because you're using your right hand to go to the arrow keys and then if you tap it, you can move it along. So every time you want to move a new machine, you have to put your hand back on the mouse, move it, take your hand off the mouse, and tap the arrows. So what I did is set it to WASD and shift. Now those cause conflicts with certain other actions. However, it allows you to keep your hand on the mouse and then hold shift and just WASD it. And you could actually move things really fast by doing it that way. However, it does break certain shortcuts, so you kind of have to change the way you play a little bit. But I think that Picker Dollies is kind of useless if you're using the arrow keys. So you, you really need to have some kind of better hotkeys set up to that. And Pipe Visualizer, similar to Belt Visualizer, just allows us to get colors and make sense of pipes. Not that we're going to have that many of them, but we are going to have more than vanilla, so this will certainly help. And I like to use the Placeables mod that will just give you a window for every item that's in your inventory that you can place on the ground. It does overlap with items that are in your quick bar, which is kind of annoying, but still, these mod packs that have a lot of potential buildings you might want to place, it is just more convenient. Not using Prospect or anything, we're just using the vanilla generation of ores. No quality of life. I am using the Q to front mod. I don't often actually use it, but if you hit Alt Q, it will make it so instead of when you add a new item to the crafting queue, it goes to the back of the queue. This will make it so it goes to the front. And in the very beginning of IR3, probably the biggest complaint people have is that there is a lot of handcrafting. And I think it takes about three minutes to handcraft a single mining drill. There are a lot of parts you have to make, so it can be really annoying if you're mid-craft and you need to make something quick. So hopefully I'll remember that this mod is here and then I can uh, press Alt-Q to switch it around because I kind of forget. Radar Night Vision is just a nice little add-on that if you have Night Vision equipped on your character and then you go to Map View, it will allow that Night Vision to apply to anything that the radars see. And uh, no Rampant because uh, not changing anything with the Biters. Rate Calculator is an extremely useful mod for IR3. It allows you to just select a group of machines. It will tell you if they're evenly balanced or if some of them are faster than others. And you kind of either need to have Hell Mod or Rate Calculator for any kind of significant build planning. And the departure from the previous series where we used Hell Mod for almost everything in this series with IR3, we're mostly going to use Rate Calculator because that's really all we need. And uh, you'll see with the way that assembling things work in IR3 that it's actually really convenient. And realistic flashlight is just a brighter, more pretty flashlight to use. It's not going to be very dark, but it looks nicer. And recipe book we can use to search for any items that we might want to make and find out where they go. Reverse factory is disabled because, of course, IR3 has a recycling element in it already, so we don't need anything like that. Robot attrition allows robots to crash over time, so you don't just build one robot and it lasts forever. Robots are really powerful in any type of modded or vanilla play without this. So basically, you're going to have to keep manufacturing robots, and as you have more and more, they will crash more and more, and eventually you won't be able to build them fast enough without upgrading your robot production. I think that balances robots quite well. The robot target mod simply tells us how many rockets we've launched. I don't think this is going to be relevant, but it's possible I might launch more than one. So having this will just give viewers an idea of how many we've launched. And I'm kind of hesitant to add rocket silo construction to this, considering that it's a content mod. However, it is compatible with IR3. So I figured, well, that might be interesting to see. And it is a neat mod. It basically makes it so you have to construct the rocket silo in six stages. You can't just make an item and plop it on the ground. Run speed toggle will allow you to change the running speed of the character, which can help if you have a highly upgraded character or you're running on fast tiles. So you can turn on and off 
exoskeletons, but what if your speed without the exoskeletons is still too fast? Well, you can change it with a mod like this. Nixie tubes give you numbers which you can attach to usually some kind of storage chest or tank to give you an idea of how many are in there without actually having to hover your mouse cursor over it. Also, they so happen to match the aesthetic of IR3 rather well. No science cost tweaker, no space extension, because these are things that are not really related to IR3. I am adding torches in, which gives you a early game or essentially beginning game light source that without this, you would have to research at least lamps. And that takes a little while in IR3. It's pushed back a little bit compared to how it would be in vanilla. So this gives us the ability to create light for nighttime right from the start without actually having to research anything. Not using transport drones because that's a pretty big content addition. Plus the factory just isn't going to be complicated enough to need them. Tree collision is a useful mod that just makes trees very small, at least with the collision box. So it allows you to run through pretty much any forest you want without constantly bumping into trees. It doesn't like let a car drive through a forest, but if you're just running around exploring on foot, it makes life a lot easier. We don't need vehicle snap, which can snap to cardinal directions to make driving on small roads easier because IR3 includes something like that. And finally, I'm using Yarm, which gives us an idea of the states of our various resource patches without us actually having to go to the map to check them. All right, let's talk about the mod settings now. If I don't talk about it, just assume that it is the default settings. For example, you can change exactly what gets recolored with the rubber belts. I added this in where the rails on the side of the belt are also the color of the belt. So besides just the arrows, and let's see if we can actually see this, we can. Or you see with the blue belt, besides just the arrows being blue, also the little rails that hold the belt up are also blue. And that just gives them a little stronger color contrast. Clockwork adds flares since it potentially can make the nights darker. I don't know if I'm actually going to use the flares since we have the torches. So I'm actually thinking I'm just going to disable them because I don't really see us using them for anything. You can have it change the capacity of the accumulators if you are changing the length of the day, but I'd rather that not happen. So I'm keeping it set to one. And I guess it's also important to mention here that this is going to be a no solar panel playthrough because I want to show off the various power production methods of IR3. And if we're using solar panels, you'll never see any of that because solar panels in Factorio in general are pretty broken because it's just a question of scale. It doesn't really matter how powerful or not they are. You just use robots to build enough of them and then you will never have power problems ever again. And it's made even worse by the fact that days in Factorio are so long compared to the nights that you just get a lot of power. So I'm not using clockwork to force that activity. I'm just going to choose to not use solar panels for anything. So we're at IR3 now and you're like, oh wow, look at that. I didn't even know they could color things like this. But when you're selecting various things, it'll actually show you what you're doing. <laughs> for example, there are special indicators here. It's kind of hard to see, but it's these little uh, heat lines on various machines to tell you what its power source is. And those lines there mean it's a burner well, you can turn that on and off if you want. You can change the colors of the turrets, and that's what I've done. I've basically made the turret the color of the icon in the game, rather than any other thing you decide, or the color of the player. Also, I have tiered the color of belts, so the three belt colors will actually appear as such on the minimap. The transfer plate is something we will cover quite soon in the playthrough, but I added the one that had the most colors to it, as opposed to monochrome, just to make it stand out a little more. Belt item brightness variation here makes it so each item on a belt is a slightly different brightness, which could make them stand out a little more, which could be potentially useful when it comes to the darker items on the belt. And actually right here, you can see the coal that's on this belt, how almost invisible it essentially is. So having any amount of variation of brightness on that will make it a little easier to see. And I'm also using the trilinear filtering on pretty much every machine just to make it look a little nicer, enabling the halo around the character with a realistic flashlight mod and i am not disabling the free play rocket win with the rocket target mod i don't want it changing anything the blending ratio of one for the automatic station painter just basically changes the color of the station instantly based on the train that is parked to it instead of making it a gradual process and this enables all of the various wagons and i disabled the one that unpaints it when it becomes empty once it goes back to the station to park, it will remain the same color that it started. So here we go with clockwork. I've mentioned it a few times, so now it's time to talk about what I actually changed, because some of you might be worried about that if you came from the Angel Bob's playthrough. But don't worry, it's basically vanilla numbers for 
the night and how long the night is, at least by a ratio. The only thing I've changed is the length of the entire cycle to be basically 30 minutes long or a little more than four times as long as it currently is. So the day will be four times as long and the night will be four times as long. However, I didn't adjust the lengths of it. So vanilla, night is only 10% of the total cycle. And the other 40% of air quotes night is simply the sun going up and down. I did not change that. So that is how it is. Making this multiplier a little longer, besides making it so the sun's not going up and down so fast all of the time, which it really is in vanilla, it makes it so it's a little easier to edit. Like, imagine I do a jump cut and it's daytime and then it's instantly night. And then I do another jump cut and it's instantly day again. And you're like, wait, what just happened? It looked like so much time went by, but it could have been a minute of time, but it looked like more. So by increasing this multiplier, it lets things smooth out a little bit and I think is a better viewing experience. However, I did adjust the start time to be the beginning of day. So in other words, when the game first starts, instead of starting like in the middle of the day, we're starting at the beginning of the day. So we have a maximum amount of sun before it goes down. The pitch black night's darkness percentage of zero don't worry, that doesn't mean you can't see it's inverted. If it's zero, it means the darkness is vanilla. And I haven't changed that. With even distribution, I have disabled the inventory cleanup. For one, I never used it with angel bobs, but also we get a similar function out of IR3, so we don't really need that. Although I haven't changed these settings, it's worth talking about them, where you can set the amount of technology that you start with in IR3, and they essentially have these different ages, like Stone Age, Copper Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, Steel Age, and the <laughs> Chrome Age. <laughs> so if you want to start further along, you can, but we're starting from the beginning, of course, so we're just going to start in the Stone Age. There is a bottomless pit item that allows you to throw things away that you don't need, because IR3 does introduce some byproducts. It's not like Angel Bob's or Pi, where it's, would you like some Factorio with your byproducts? But in this case, it does add a few compared to vanilla, which essentially adds none. And it's pretty trivial to deal with if you have any experience with those other mods. However, if you really want the ability to just destroy items for free, it will let you. But if you read the description here, it tells you you really don't need to and it recommends that you don't turn it on. You can void gases though. And actually you can see it in place right here that these little machines are voiding gases. So it does let you do that. This is a nice little add-on that if you're not fighting biters, you can just hide the military stuff so it's not part of your tree. And that's kind of a neat little thing. Surprised you don't see it more often. And I'm using default numbers for everything that I did changes in the previous playthrough in order to help UPS, but I don't think that's going to be a problem this time around, so we're back to the default settings. And with the rocket target mod, I'm specifically using it to track the number of rockets we've launched, not something else like the number of satellites we've launched. And I've disabled the map markers for yarn because it just uh, cleans up the map a little bit. With additional pace settings, normally every time you hold shift and click, it will give you one craft worth of logistics requests on the chest, but that's not really enough. So I like setting it to five. I think that's a lot better than like the 30 seconds by default that you would get. I've disabled the icon for hell mod from being at the, at the top left up here because it also puts it in the bottom right as well, and it doesn't need to be in both places. Also, more Industrial Revolution 3 settings. They give you lots of cool stuff to choose, and uh, we will talk about the fuel manager eventually. It's kind of out of the scope of right now because it's something that's completely new. But you basically want to have it all as default. The only thing I've changed is I have added the autocorrect driving for those tiles that by default it is off. So if you want to have your vehicles drive on roads, more or less, you still have to kind of control them, but at least they'll stick to the road a little bit. You do have to enable it. And with run speed toggle, I'm actually using it to nerf the character's walking speed rather than increase their walking speed. It's probably the opposite use of how most people use this, but I'm not using it as a buff. And zero is normal walking speed, so I have set it so the fastest walking speed is normal, and then I'm slowing it down with the slower walking speeds. It's a little weird, but that's how I'm using it. And with Yarm, by default, it will order the items based on estimated time to completion, but I prefer remaining percentage instead because otherwise they'll be jumping around the list every time a train comes through. So if you don't use trains, default works pretty well, but if you do use trains, then obviously every time a train comes by, it's gonna suddenly use way more resources and it's gonna jump around the list a few times and then the train goes and then it jumps again. And I've disabled the ore summary lines because that just kind of adds a little bit of uh, extra details that you don't really need. 
Basically what it does is, let's say you have three iron patches instead of one. Besides showing you the three iron patches, you'll have a separate set of lines that will add them all together and show you what they total up to be. But I don't really feel like that's a feature that I need. And we're back again because it had to restart, of course, because I changed some stuff. But one other thing worth mentioning here are some of the vanilla Factorio settings that I changed. Specifically in the interface here, one thing I disable is the show mod owners in tooltips. And in a lot of people's series, if you look to the right here, you will see like the owner of the item or, you know, vanilla Factorio or however. And sometimes that list can get very long and it's largely useless information that just clutters the screen. So you can disable it here and just not have to look at it. Because I don't really care if a certain item came from IR3 or if it's a vanilla item. I mean, I think we could figure that out, but also who cares? That's not information that's relevant to playing the game. That's only useful if you're trying to diagnose something that's not working correctly. Another thing, you can change the train visualization length based on how big you normally make your train. So this is how many squares will appear when you're working with a train station when you're trying to place the various train station supporting items. And since I normally do one locomotive and four wagons, you can set that to five just so it's long enough and it doesn't display extra train wagons that aren't relevant. Also, I like to have all four quick bars enabled. Normally, it uh, defaults to two, so if you wonder how do you get those four quick bars there, well, that is where you set it. And some of these others might be different from vanilla, but uh, those are the big things that uh, I change. That covers the mods and the settings, so let's go into the map generation. We'll do single player, new game, free play. And the great thing about IR3 is they also include special generation settings specifically for IR3. And of course it starts with challenging, which might scare you, but I think this is more just default settings. Resources are rarer, lakes are larger. There is the tech marathon, which is essentially the same thing, but technology cost is 10 times as high. On one hand, that seems like the kind of thing I would want to do, but on the other, I don't want to artificially bloat this playthrough just for that because I do want to get into pie. So we're just going to do challenging here and you can see definitely what it does is it reduces the frequency and richness of most resources. And I guess we can talk about that too, where there are a few more resources than vanilla, but not a lot more. There's a gold patch that you have to deal with now, as well as gas fissures, which we will later cover, but essentially they are infinite resources that occasionally appear on the map and you can put like a derrick on there to gather them. It might seem kind of broken, but they're not really because they don't give you high value resources. It's kind of hard to explain without showing what they are, but uh, this definitely sets those correctly and you probably don't want to change them from how they are. And then map generation, you can see it definitely makes it have more water, but otherwise it leaves things the same. There is one thing to think about here, and that is rubber trees and they definitely talk about it here. You have to find some amount of rubber trees to start making rubber. If you, you can't make the rubber from nothing. And as it describes, if you have a map that won't generate very many trees, in other words, it's either dry or cold, you could sort of softlock yourself <laughs> in a map generation if it's uh, too cold or too dry. And I would prefer to just uh, play a seed here without doing the preview first because I like to live dangerously, however, <laughs> If it loads and it's all ice, then ooh, that'll be bad. Not to mention that ice is kind of annoying that walking on snow is some of the slowest tiles that you can walk on in the alien biomes. So we probably should change that. But since we are, we'll go back to it in a second. IR3 does change the time factor for evolution. It makes it a lot slower. Otherwise, things are the same and they are well matched to IR3's pace. So, no reason to change it. We are using biters. <laughs> and it doesn't touch anything on the final page here. All right, so now we are back to deciding what we want to do with these alien biomes. I am leaving cliffs on. I don't like cliffs, but I don't think anyone likes them either. I don't want to completely get rid of cold climates because those could be potentially interesting to see. And I guess we could use the map generation to kind of see what it would do and just change the seed. So let's turn on the preview for a second here. And this is actually a cold one, but let's make a few new ones. See if we can get one that's an ice map. There we go. <laughs> this is the thing I would be afraid of, is getting an ice map with almost no anything else. It's kind of terrifying. 
It looks like there'd be a little knot ice there, but I'm guessing it's not going to be warm enough for those trees. So now that we have an oops all ice seed, let's change these settings a little bit to see if we can make it not form anymore. <laughs> Or at least not be completely covered in ice. Man, that's still a cold map. It looks a little better, but let's uh, switch the bias for moisture, because we definitely also want it to be kind of wet. I'm not sure if that's really going to make too much difference. That seems to, for sure, because there's like actual green down there, where if we don't do this... Oh yeah, that's a big difference. So we definitely want to nudge this up a bit. There we go. We got some normal trees there. Still have ice. So maybe let's see if we back off the ice a little bit. Are we still going to have it? Oh yeah, so we definitely need this to stay limited. So there we go. This started as a oops all ice seed and now it's still there. But we've almost nerfed it away into oblivion. So let's try some new seeds. Make sure it doesn't give us complete junk. Well, that's kind of a normal one. And that's pretty normal, too. That one's pretty good. It has the volcanic area down there. But basically, as long as you have not ice and you have coastline like this, this coastline is the perfect place to find the river trees. So as long as you have coastline and it's not, like, completely dry. So up here it's wet and down here it's super dry, but that's fine you get early vehicles, and this is a drier seed, for sure, but the trees will still form, I believe. <laughs> well, that would be an interesting one if we got it, because that's all uh, volcanic stuff, which I think is the slowest tiles to run on. However, the trees would probably still be in this area right here, so we wouldn't have had to go very far to actually get the trees. So I think we have some good settings to use here. Okay. Let's get rid of the preview. Change the seeds a few times. Make sure everything else is good. I believe so. So from here, all that's left is cooking play and generating the seed. But that's going to end this episode. And the next episode, which will be episode one, will be the official start of our playthrough. So thanks for watching, and I will see you later.